Hey everyone, this is Kevin from thechesswebsite.com. Today we are in round 8 of the 2015 Norway Chess Tournament. Been an epic tournament so far. 10 of the top players in the world competing against each other. We've seen the champion just get demolished. We've seen other competitors step up their game so far. Two of those players we're going to be watching today. White's going to be played by Anish Jiri, 20-year-old Grandmaster Superstar. He's just been doing phenomenal so far, especially for so young. He's going to be a force to be reckoned with for many, many years to come. His opponent, Topolov, is crushing this tournament he already has five wins in the first seven rounds and two ties has yet to lose if he actually picks up a win in this game then he's won the tournament even with one round left his opponent Vishinan in round nine uh, is going to be second behind him but still this will be game over he will have already clinched there's no way that Vishinan will catch him so very important uh, both in each years he's trying to climb up the leaderboard get a top three spot and Topolov trying to just wrap this thing up today so pretty exciting match for us today we'll go ahead and start with uh, Jiri playing pawn to d4 knight f6 upon c4 pawn e6 and then knight to f3 some of the earlier matches we've looked at in this tournament so far, uh, we've kind of seen the Nimzo Indian with knight to c3. Instead, Anish Jiri decides to go for the knight to f3. Uh, pawn to d5, pawn to g3, and then bishop down here to b4. Sort of that Bogo Indian style uh, where the bishop comes down here to b4, check, but white doesn't have this knight here on c3, which you see a lot in the Nimzo Indian, white a lot of times we'll try to avoid that line, which we see in this particular case. Uh, and then we continue from here. White has a few options, but really the only option you ever see is bishop to d2. There's no real need to play knight to c3 since that's kind of what white's avoided in this spot. Doesn't want to have that double pawn here on the c file. Uh, and if you played knight here to d2, uh, this just kind of hampers the development of your dark square bishop right here. Um, so not seen very often, but bishop here to d2, uh, and then Toblov plays bishop back here to e7. This is probably the more passive option that he has uh, in this particular case. He could just take with his bishop here on d2. This is probably more drawish, which Toblov may be completely fine with getting a draw here uh, since he doesn't need that many more points to actually win the tournament, although he wouldn't lock it up with a tie. Uh, the worst he could do is the draw. Uh, but he could play pretty aggressive. He could play queen to e7, protecting this that's going to be fine could always play pawn to a5 pretty aggressive uh, move attacking the queen side of the board right here knowing that his opponent's probably going to be castling over here on the the king side with the bishop on here g2 fianchetto uh, castle shortly thereafter so immediately starting the attack on the king queen side would be good but decides for the more passive play of bishop here to e7 now one thing he does look at is white played his bishop here to d2 White, if he wants to have a more active bishop, he's going to have to move it as well. So White's going to lose a, a tad bit of tempo play there uh, by if he wants to bring it to bishop here to g5, if he wants to play bishop here to uh, c3. Um, all those is not going to be stuck here on d2 for too long. Bishop here to g2, as we talked about, Fianchetto, castle on the king side, and then castle on the king side for White. Black now plays pawn here to c6, kind of morphing into a semi-slav defense where Black's really trying to hold on to the central light squares, specifically the d5 square. And then once he's kind of done that, he's going to be looking to push on the queen side and gain a queen side advantage with this pawns protected by his minor pieces. So you queen here to c2, just developing pieces, knight here to d7. Rook over here to d1, centralizing that rook right now. Uh, pawn here to b6, and then pawn to a5, so really starting to push forward on the queen side. Bishop here to c3, as we talked about, white has to get a more active piece form his bishop, and so he kind of gave up that tempo move that we discussed earlier. Bishop here to b7, just another defender on this central square here on d5. Knight here to d2, pawn here to c5. So Toplov starting to play, he started out a little bit passive, and now he's really being pretty aggressive. He recognizes that he has a strong setup right now, so he's going to try to push forward on the queen side. Knight here to e5, and we see a capture here on d4 and the recapture. 
and then some material comes off the board, and then queen over here to c8. And it's important to note uh, that the pawn can't take here on c4 because this bishop is on g2, and so we could easily take this bishop here on uh, b7, and wants to make sure that white can't just take here on uh, d5. So it brings this queen over here, uh, both protecting that, the pawn can't take, and also protecting this bishop here on b7. Now the rook's going to swing over to support that queen as well. Uh, now after the pawn takes, we see the bishop take here on f6. After the bishop takes, now the queen's going to come up here and we see an exchange off the board. Uh, so both sides deciding that they're just going to kind of exchange down to the later stages of the middle game going into the end game, which uh, my opinion probably favors Topolov a lot more just because any points that he can get, whether it's half a point for a tie or a full point for a win, is going to be gravy for him. Um, so Anish Jiri probably needs to play a little bit different style in my opinion if he wants to try to get that win try to move up the leaderboard after the king takes we see the queen come here to a b7 check and then queen over here to e4 pretty interesting for me not to see the queen take here on e4 uh, i thought black definitely was going to exchange right here uh, but decides to go and bring his rook over here to b8 and he could have brought his rook here to b8 as well he didn't have to do that but he decided to go ahead and get his uh, rook over here from f8 involved into the action now the rook up here to c6 pretty aggressive move uh, but not really uh, threatening too much queen over here to d7 now the rook's going to come back we do see a few of the same moves uh, and then the queens decide to come off the board right here uh, and then white decides to get pretty aggressive with his knight. Now in this end game, uh, we have the rook and knight versus the, the rooks and bishop usually is going to uh, favor the side with uh, the knight. You can usually cut off what the bishop can do. You can always put your pawns on uh, the opposite color. So in this particular case, put the pawns on the light squares. Uh, this knight can be very, very problematic especially if they can keep everything on one side of the board, uh, that's going to favor white. So going into the end game, Anishiri definitely has a small advantage here with a very centralized knight, uh, and he does have control of both the C and the D file, uh, where Toblov over here, his rook, on A and B file aren't really controlling anything. They're playing somewhat defensive. So small advantage. We'll see kind of how that plays out going into the end game. Black now brings his bishop back here to e7, uh, knight to d6. Could at any time, Topolov could just exchange off material, decides not to. He wants to kind of go for that win. Uh, now the knight's just going to bounce around, attacking this pawn over here on b6. Uh, and then there's an exchange off the board. Just simplify things a little bit more. Pawn here to b5, a knight here to e5. As you can see, it's kind of a pain just to have to worry about this knight because he can bounce over everywhere so easily. Uh, now knight up here to d7, attacking the bishop. Rook over here to c1. After the exchange right here, the bishop to e7. Rook over here to c7. And this is where you want your rook. You want it attacking the 7th rank. If you're white, if you're black, you want to bring it down here to uh, the second rank right here. So very aggressive spot uh, from white. Can always bring his rook over here to b7, attacking the pawn. Um, if he... You know, if this rook were to move, you always have the threat of rook here to c8. That's going to be extremely bad, especially with we have the knight here protecting the square here on f8. So that would be a quick checkmate. So black has to worry about that. Uh, so you can see black's definitely playing a defensive game right here. His pieces are not super active. They're just trying to hold on uh, so that Nishiri doesn't have an advantage going into the later stages of the end game. Pawn here to g4 is a pretty creative move, I think, from Nishiri. He recognizes that he needs to go ahead and tack on the king side. Uh, he has the queen side kind of locked up as far as attacking. Um, his opponent can't do much besides defend on the queen side. So what better than to go ahead and put more pressure on the king side, knowing that his opponent can't defend everything. Now pawn here to h5 and taking. Now you may say, well, that's kind of weird. Black just straight up gave up material, and he did, but it's it's going to be fairly easy for him to get that material back. Once he gets his king involved into the action, he can bring his king down here. Once he takes that, he'll have a central king, uh, and that's going to be fairly easy for him to get a hold of. He can also get his other pieces if he needs to. Um, help as well, you know, if the king tries to start marching up the board as well. Uh, but pawn up here to b4, giving that material uh, back uh, for a more active knight. This knight is just going to be very, very troublesome for black. Uh, so it's attacking this pawn here on f7. 
And after the rook to d5, we see the knight take up here on f7. Uh, and then the rook can just swing over here to h5, another way for black to gobble that material back. Uh, pawn here to f4, pushing forward. King to g6. And then this pesky little knight right here has the outpost from this pawn here on f4. So using all the material very, very nicely. Uh, these pawns and the knight are just working so well together. Now the knight coming back here to f7. Now to e5 again, so we have a two-fold repetition. If we were to repeat this one more time, uh, it would be a tie game. Anish Jiri, sensing uh, that he has the upper hand, does not want to tie this game. So plays knight back here to f3. And then knight up here to a g5, a little bit better outpost move for him, attacking the king right here. Uh, and then he's going to, in just a second, take this material here on e6. This bishop on d2 can't really do too much. It's just protecting this pawn here on b4, but there's really no good way for black to continue to push forward. Uh, black's pieces are not working well at all. This knight's being a huge nuisance right now. Rook over here to h5, and now knight taking on g7 is being protected by this rook as well here on b7. So white doing a good job in this endgame, playing beautiful tactful chess. Uh, so that's always good to see. Rook down here to h2, knight to f5, and then after knight to e7, we see it come here to d5, check, and then after king to e4, there's not much places left for black to go uh, and so we see a rook here to a b6 and then we're going to see uh, black decide to go ahead and resign after the rook comes down here to b4 and capture that pawn so uh, knight to or excuse me king to d6 uh, and then the last move of the game was king here to d4 so perfect in game i think from anish jiri uh, topolov just he couldn't get his pieces working together. Uh, his bishop was pretty much rendered useless, trying to protect a pawn here and there in the end game. And the knight was just all over the board. Uh, really allowed him to gain control of the end game uh, and squeak out a win here. So Topolov really needed some points. Instead, got zero points. Uh, Anish Jiri now moved up into a tie for third place. So congratulations to him uh, as he goes into uh, the last round with an opportunity to get second place. Unfortunately, he can't win this in the last round, round nine, we're going to have Topolov versus Vichy Anon. If Topolov wins or he ties, he will be crowned champion. If Vichy Anon wins, uh, Vichy Anon will go on to win. Uh, one of those two will win. No one else has the opportunity to win, uh, just as far as how the, the points uh, shape up right now. So that's going to be an exciting match. That will be the match that we cover um, in round nine, just so everyone is aware of that. But hopefully you guys are enjoying this tournament. A lot of coverage so far. I think we've gone over six or seven matches so far, so things are going pretty well. Uh, but definitely enjoying this tournament. It was such high-level chess, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching, everybody.